would like to extend a warm welcome to Sir Jeremy James Farrar, Director of Wellcome. Wellcome is an independent funder for research on major global, global health challenges, especially science discovery, mental health, infectious disease and climate. Sir Jeremy has a background in immunology and medicine. He has worked as director of the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit in Vietnam for 18 years before he joined Wellcome as director in 2013. As part of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, he is a member of the UK government's scientific advisory group for emergencies, SAGE, the UK Vaccine Task Force, and the principals group of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator of the World Health Organization. And he chairs the WHO R&D Blueprint Advisory Group. We are very grateful that you are here today to share with us some of your insights on lessons learned on the COVID-19 pandemic. You're a very busy person, we see, and on the importance of global strategies and solutions, the essential role of science and the humanities in developing strategies and solutions in a global con context. After your talk, we will have some time for Q&As, and that can be fed already in on the platform during the talk of Sir Jeremy. Um, Sir Jeremy, welcome. The screen is yours. Uh, thank, thank you very, very much. Um, no, no matter how many of these Zoom calls or Teams calls you do, it's always a, um, an anxious moment when you, when you go live to make sure somebody out there can, can hear you. So I, I hope it's all uh, working technically. And uh, thank you very, very much. A, for that very generous introduction, but also for the uh, invitation to, to join you today. I'm just sorry we can't do it in person, but I hope some point in the next uh, 12 months we'll be able to meet in person. And just to pick up on, on the uh, comments earlier from, from Kacek, I, I, I couldn't agree more with the, the background that was presented there from, uh, from DFG. Um, so much of, of what was articulated there I think is common common to us all, and there will be some themes that come out in in what I go on to say, which I think uh, fits perfectly with um, with those comments in in introduction. So, um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, firstly, just a little bit of, of um, uh, background. Uh, as you say, I, I come through a clinical scientific background. I've had the privilege and pleasure um, to work with at least some if not many of the colleagues who will be on this phone over uh, on this call over in fact many many years going going back to if i remember rightly um uh, sars one in 2000 and 2003 to 2004 and then the outbreaks of, of bird flu in vietnam when i was living in in vietnam um uh, between 1995 and, and 2013 so i have many many fond memories of Ex extraordinary scientific partnership and collaborations with colleagues on this phone for which I'm very, very grateful and many of which continue uh, today. Uh, many of you may not know Welcome that well, so just a very brief on Welcome. We are, I think, the first or the second largest uh, global uh, philanthropic organisation now, um, completely independent of any political ties or any commercial ties. Um, we have our, we're fortunate, we're very fortunate. We have our own endowment, which uh, drives the, our ability to fund science. Uh, that endowment today stands at about 37 or 38 uh, billion pounds, so 45, 50 billion euros. Uh, and we grant, uh, we award, um, we fund, about 1.2 to 1.5 billion euros uh, a year. So it's very small in comparison with um, with DFG. Um, and, and so we're a different organization. Um, I hope we can do some things differently, uh, but we're not at the scale of government funding. And that's, uh, I think, a very important uh, feature. A few years ago now, probably three or four years ago now, Welcome having been set up in the 1930s and only ever had uh, actually an office in uh, in London in the UK, I decided uh, a few years ago now that we we that was no longer acceptable, particularly in the context of some political changes that you'll all be aware of in the last few years. And and so we did open an office in Germany um, to ensure that Welcome uh, 
uh, expanded its uh, connections and its partnerships with colleagues uh, around the world, but particularly in Europe. Um, and I hope that that office, which has now been in present for three or four years, uh, will be the catalyst for increasing our connectivity with uh, with colleagues and scientists um, and policymakers across uh, Europe and therefore around the world. So I look forward to um, uh, to extending that uh, partnership with Germany in the in the in the coming future. A proviso which has come through again this morning already, but I, I, just, I don't need to remind anybody, I'm sure, but, but this pandemic is far from over. Um, too often in the recent past, you've, uh, I've certainly read in, in the media, on television, uh, elsewhere, that, that we're, we're close to the end of it. I, I just do not believe that to be true. And in fact, I don't think there is an end, if you like. Um, uh, and it, there certainly is not an end until there is uh, until there is an end everywhere. Um, and the UK has been through a very, very difficult period. It still has an incredibly high level of transmission, one in 60 or so people infected in the UK today. And of course, across Europe, uh, numbers are rising tragically again. Um, and so there is still a huge amount of work to be done in order to bring this acute phase of the pandemic to an end, but then also understand, and this is again where science has just got such a critical role, what do we mean as we transition from the acute pandemic phase, uh, which we're in the midst of now, into what I believe will become an endemic state? Uh, I think this infection is now part of humanity forever, uh, or at least for a very, very long time. Um, and that will require us to think very differently, think differently scientifically, but also think very differently in terms of our communication, uh, uh, the trust between all of us and society uh, as we go through uh, a period of transition from a pandemic epidemic phase into a, an endemic phase, because it, the, the, the talk or the, or the communication about pandemics ending I don't think is going to be like this. I don't think, I don't believe that this is going to be like Ebola, where you'll be able to just say there are no more cases happening that we know of of Ebola. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to get to that state. And that will require a deep understanding of that transition phase. And I'm not sure whether it's the first, certainly the first in the modern era, where we've made that transition from a global pandemic into an endemic setting. I can't think of another infectious disease where we've lived through that transition with this degree of knowledge. Uh, but also accept with humility the degree of uncertainty about what's coming uh, in the future. But I wanted to, to start by just looking back a little bit, and I've already mentioned the interactions I've had with, uh, with colleagues on this call, going back to SARS-1, 2003-2004. But actually, I believe this, this, if you like, modern era uh, really started, at least in my experience, with the outbreak of Nipah virus in Malaysia in 1999. Um, and if we think through that 20-year period from 1999 to 2019, we saw a series of uh, either national, regional or global epidemics and pandemics. And I, I, I will forget some, inevitably, because there have been so many. But Nipah, followed by SARS-1, followed by bird flu, H5M1, followed by the pandemic of influenza of 2009, of course, M Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, uh, Zika, Ebola in a very, very different context to what we'd been used to. Um, and of course now uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19. Um, so even with having forgotten some, um, you look back over that 20 year period and every few years there has been an event which, as I say, either nationally, regionally or globally, has been uh, disruptive to some degree in some communities. And so actually, I think that instead of seeing these as discrete episodes, we, we need to see these as actually the era that we're living in, which others, not myself, but others have called the pandemic era. And I think there is some truth in that. The epidemics themselves, the pandemics themselves are crucially important, but they're almost a symptom of the world we're living in in the 21st century, because the key drivers of each of those, I would argue, uh, going back to Nipper in 1999 and being fairly consistent throughout, has been that the key drivers are key uh, structural issues of the 21st century. Uh, 
Um, and they are a combination of ecological change, land use change, uh, yes, climate change, environment change. They are urbanization where uh, epidemics, which in previous era might have uh, petered out within a rural setting, uh, have come uh, uh, to become amplified uh, in huge uh, urban centers. Uh, and then, of course, those urban centers are um, linked by travel and trade, both uh, nationally uh, and internationally, at a speed which was unthinkable a generation ago. Um, and so you have the key drivers, all of which I think to some degree have played a role in each of those epidemics of the last 20 years. And those drivers are not going to go away. And the additional driver I would mention is geopolitics. Uh, I feel very strongly that this pandemic has been made worse by the tense geopolitics of the era that we live in. And it isn't just West-East relations, it's also North-South relations, which I think are, if anything, getting worse as a result of vaccine inequity. So geopolitics also plays a role in where these pandemics are, are, are going to both initiate, start, and also where they're going to spread. We should remember that Ebola uh, first described in 1976, um, uh, up until 2014, largely caused rural outbreaks, which could horrible for the communities they were in, uh, but could be controlled relatively easily uh, by, by corralling and closing off villages and towns and therefore stopping the further spread. In Ebola in 2014, I don't believe the virus had changed, the host communities had not changed. What had changed is the social construct that everybody was living in. And that is perhaps the most important point through this and uh, that I'd like to make. And, and that is that fragmentation and silos and uh, uh, our ability and the way we do science, I think, has to evolve and change in order to meet the great challenges of the 21st century. Uh, it is crucial to have deep expertise. I'm, I'm uh, repeatedly make the argument of the need for deep expertise, but I do believe that we're going to have to think, how do we not just have our deep expertise in vertical structures, either in global health architecture or indeed in faculties and universities and academic institutions, but how can we also make sure we link those deep expertise in a horizontal way that allows us to come together, not in a forced marriage, not in a forced partnership, not driven by funders, but where we can see a systems approach to the solutions led by deep knowledge, but by willingness of us as scientists to work at the interfaces between disciplines and within disciplines, rather than sticking to our own, um, our own uh, uh, areas of expertise and not willing. Because these, uh, these challenges of the 21st century, and it isn't just pandemics, I believe it also applies to the challenge of climate change. I think uh, there's, uh, it will also apply to other areas, certainly of our interest in neuroscience, neurology, mental health, psychiatry. Um, I think it's at the interfaces between disciplines where the real uh, scientific advances would be made. And I think we've all got to learn how, to, how do we move from being uh, supporting, funding, uh, doing that deep science. We must continue to have that deep science. I am a great believer in experts, unlike some in some political parties in this country. I'm a great believer in experts. But I think we need to somehow frame the debates into a more complex systems approach as well as um, a reductionist scientist approach, whilst not losing the, the skills of reductionist science. And the reason for that is that I think that the 21st century challenges uh, are going to be, if you like, all of societal challenges. And you see that again in COVID. Uh, the, I've, I've portrayed COVID's disruption of society as coming in four overlapping but, but linked circles. The first one is the impact of the virus itself on health uh, and science. Uh, that is profound enough with uh, now reported over 5 million deaths. And of course, we all know that the reality is probably somewhere between 15 and 20 million deaths globally already. There is the uh, consequences of that for people's illness, long COVID and, and many other issues. So there's the direct inner circle, the first circle of the direct consequences of the COVID on health itself. But there's a second circle around that, and that is the indirect consequences for health. 
um, because every system in the world, even in the world's richest countries, and actually Germany is, is, has more capacity than many countries, and so a little bit more protected certainly than the UK is, and certainly compared to middle-income countries. But nevertheless, the impact of COVID is not just on the direct inner circle of health, it's on the outer circle, that the disruption to healthcare, healthcare workers, and the whole structure means that the whole of healthcare is disrupted from neonatal health to vaccination schedules around the world to issues of mental health, access to tuberculosis and HIV therapies, uh, cancer care, diabetic care. There is the indirect consequences which are profoundly disruptive. And then the third circle, which in some ways uh, may be more, even more profound than those two, is the disruption to economies, the disruption to trade, the disruption to debt, the disruption to trust between the governed and the governing, between the public, the communities and institutions. Those have been disrupted and questioned in almost every country. Um, and that impact on economies, uh, on education, on opportunity for the future is going to be profound and longer lasting, even potentially than the direct and indirect health consequence. So the third circle encompasses all of those peripheral secondary consequences of such a disruption. And then the fourth one I would mention, and, and again, it's a fourth overlapping circle, is the geopolitics. Um, we've seen since January 2020, we've seen uh, one country blaming another. Uh, we've seen increasing tension, yes, between East and West that we've known about for many years, um, but also increasingly and understandably, I think, between North and South, as uh, the rich world has been able to both do the science and benefit from the science in terms of diagnostics, in terms of treatments, in terms of access to vaccines, and yet much of the world is not benefiting from that science. That inequality in access to all of the tools required, it was the genesis of setting up the ACT Accelerator, which was mentioned earlier at the World Health Organization. That inequality of access to the benefits of the science around the world, I think will lead to a really challenging ability, uh, A, to bring the pandemic to the acute end by the distribution and use and availability of vaccines, but also it will make us uh, very much harder to bring the world together to cooperate and collaborate on all other issues. And to some degree, I think we've seen that tension playing out at COP26 over the last couple of weeks, where countries are increasingly saying, well, you, you were not there for us when the pandemic hit. Why now should we reach out and work in partnership and collaboration uh, for other issues which you're pushing? And I, I think, again, the geopolitics of the impact of this pandemic cannot be understated. Uh, and I think we must address them. The, one of the great challenges we face is in these times when, when these great challenges, pandemics, climate change, um, uh, energy use, wa water access, antimicrobial resistance, what, whatever you choose as the great challenge of the 21st century, I think there are some common features. And many, one of those, for me at least, is that those are essentially transnational. Um, that, that it is Im impossible or very difficult for any individual country to solve them on their own. And they're likely to affect not just single countries, but multiple countries in regions or indeed around the world. And yet we're structured in, understandably, in a country perspective. And politically, I think one of our challenges is how do we balance those um, political domestic pressures, making vaccines available to the citizens in my country, uh, whilst our enlightened self-interest and indeed scientific and public health interest may well be to make uh, to share those vaccines in this case more widely around the world. How do we balance that politics where your domestic tensions are pulling you in one direction and your international responsibilities and probably international self-interest is pulling you in the opposite direction? And I think uh, many countries, all countries in some way, are challenged with that at the moment. And yet, actually, if we look at the challenges of the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, I think many of them will have those features. The other feature which I think binds these issues together is that science has got a critical role to play. Uh, and science, uh, and when I talk about science, I mean science uh, in its broadest possible sense. I mean biomedical science, uh, 
I mean life sciences, I mean the physical and natural sciences, I mean the social sciences, ethics, economics. Uh, I, I mean by science the broadest brushstroke. And uh, again, it's why I think that the, uh, the interfaces between disciplines that I've talked about is just going to be so important in order to uh, address these challenges that we face. And yet, in many ways, our funding agencies, and I talk here from a welcome perspective historically, although we're going through a period of profound reform at the moment to try and address this. But I think our funding bodies and potentially our universities and academic institutions are nevertheless still structured in ways that fit more with a fragmented approach to, to the world. The second thought I'd make um, is that one of the key lessons to me from every epidemic I've been involved in and essentially every crisis is that you rely so much on what you have before the crisis. If you're trying to build any of these partnerships, collaboration uh, in the midst of a crisis, you will either fail or you'll be too slow to make a difference. Uh, what you have before a crisis, both in capacity, human capacity, infrastructure, scientific endeavor, trust. Trust is a crucial one I'd like to come back to. Uh, whatever you have before a crisis, which largely determine your ability to respond in a very fast moving dynamic crisis, which again is likely to be the sorts of problems we faced in the 21st century. Um, you cannot build trust in a crisis. You cannot build into a political system, scientific advice into governments to influence policy decision making if you're only structuring that at the time of a crisis. There is a, a difference of language, there's a difference of culture, there's a difference of ways of approaching things, and that is impossible to build in a crisis. You, you really must have these institutions, they must be trusted, they must be transparent and communicate, and I think that also is true of the scientific endeavor. And it's why um, DFG and Welcome, I think, share a very common interest in the support of fundamental discovery, curiosity-driven science uh, that is not structured, is not strategic uh, necessarily, uh, but which is providing that bedrock of expertise, skill, uh, and knowledge that can then, if necessary, in a crisis, either prevent the crisis, which is even better, or if there is a crisis that develops, can then pivot very quickly in order to take that on. And I think the second key lesson that I've learned is that that fundamental long-term investment in the capacities that you may need to deal with whichever and whatever crisis comes to, uh, to affect you is so fundamental to your ability to respond in a crisis. Um, and that needs a long-term perspective. It needs infrastructure. It needs critically people. It needs the ability for those people to be attracted to this world, and particularly the world of science. It means we need career structures that retain them and offer them a, a, a good future as a career because the scientific endeavor is now competing with many other different sectors, uh, and it means the long-term investment. But it also critically means transparency. It means engagement and involvement of the communities that we're all part of, uh, and it was great to hear earlier the work that's done through DFG, and uh, I've watched in awe of, uh, and I don't want to mention names because I'll forget somebody, but but a lot of the fantastic public communication and trust that has been built up through the pandemic, through many people on this call who have played such a critical role in engaging and involving communities and the public. And, and we must not lose this. Um, I think this is essentially our license to operate. I think it's the engagement with societies that's so critical. And it means building that sense of trust, not in a crisis, but before a crisis hits, in order to uh, address the, the great challenges that, that, that we will inevitably uh, come to face. And that capacity is multifaceted. Um, it is about discovery science, curiosity science, but it is also other aspects that we do all need. It is about the regulatory environment. It is about career structures. It is about ensuring that there is a pathway for academic discoveries to go and be commercialized and made into products, which the academic world is not going to do on their own. Uh, and we saw that, of course, with the great basic science, so much of which was funded by the public purse in Germany as much as anywhere else with uh, the BioNTech science that came out of uh, 
uh, government-funded uh, basic discovery science and partnerships with scientists, and then has been commercialized and, of course, has produced one of the world's uh, great uh, COVID vaccines. That's also a lesson, that there is a pathway from academic discovery through um, innovation, through commercialization, and, uh, uh, and into products that can make a difference to people's lives. I do think we've also got to relook at that, though, and look at it in the terms of the public investment, whether uh, taxpayer, public money, or philanthropic money, indeed, and how that has uh, underpinned so many of the advances which are now coming and through the commercial sector. We do need the commercial sector, but I think we're going to have to rethink how the public and the commercial sector interact in the future. Um, we cannot leave the development of products, whether diagnostic tests, drugs, vaccines, uh, products in the social sciences arena, uh, behavioral change, uh, or whatever we talk about. We cannot just leave that to the commercial drivers of the marketplace. We leave, if we do so, we leave society very, very vulnerable to an only commercial driver. And I think we have to work together uh, to uh, ensure that the public sector public taxpayers' money and philanthropy is pushing, encouraging, and making happen some of those interventions that we need for these sorts of events that are rare and there may not be a commercial driver. I do not believe in future, whether it be for the development of antimicrobial agents, for antimicrobial resistance, or indeed for pandemics and many other things, that we can purely leave this to the marketplace and the commercial driver. And yes, I don't think we've got our construct of the public, private, and philanthropic um, triangle right in order to make sure that we have these uh, key, um, key products that we all need. Just bringing to a close now, um, a couple of more comments. One is, is, and I probably don't need to say this to this audience, but I think politically one does need to say this, and that is we have to take warnings seriously. Um, we've had many warnings of pandemics over the last 20 years, and I've, I've articulated some of them, and there are many others as well. Uh, I believe if you look back, we had warnings of the great financial crisis of 2008. We saw red flags rising uh, that were telling us that something was not right, and yet we chose to ignore it. And I think, indeed, we did that through the pandemic. We had many warnings, indeed, of coronaviruses, uh, that the the, the change of ecology was driving the new emergence on a more frequent and more complex basis. And yet we chose not to take those warnings seriously enough. And I think in future, we need to both invest all the time in the discovery, but we also must be really uh, mindful when we get these warning signs that things are changing. Uh, and instead of always reacting to them, we should be seeking to uh, prevent, prevent them. So I will bring to a close now and in conclusion, um, I'd just like to sort of reiterate, if you like, uh, a few points. One is that what you have before a crisis largely determines your ability to respond to it, prevent it and respond to it. And that means investment over years and years and years in discovery science of all its colors and hues and types, and that we should encourage where we can and where it's driven by the scientific community the uh, work at the interfaces between disciplines. Secondly, that doing the science is not enough. I think we need to ensure that we uh, build trust. Society and science, science is part of society and will only thrive with the support of the societies and communities we're part of. And you cannot build trust in a crisis. You must build trust all the time. And that your scientific advice into politics and po policy making needs to not just, again, be in a crisis. The cultural divides are too big. The language is too big. That scientific advice needs to be fed into governments, independent of political parties, all of the time, so that when a crisis hits, there is a relationship, a partnership there that can be built on. Thirdly, that I think there needs to be a combination of crucially bottom-up science, discovery, curiosity science, but I do think we need to think strategically, how will we address some of these challenges that we won't foresee all of them, but we can foresee some of them and make sure that we're not vulnerable to the gaps that will inevitably uh, be created between the academic, the commercial sector, and make sure as funders now that we're not being too top down, but we're not also fearful of doing a combination of discovery, curiosity science, but also some strategic perspective of where we think great challenges are going to lie in the future.
And the last thing, uh, uh, two things I'd say is um, invest for the long term. DFG does that, I think, uh, with great skill. I hope we do this at Welcome. Uh, investing for the long term in science is what's required. And finally, if you do not choose to reform after a crisis which has exposed gaps and weaknesses, inequalities, and uh, whether in access to vaccines or healthcare, if you don't choose to reform at that point, you'll never reform. So one of the key lessons for me coming th not through this crisis, but in the midst of it, but looking beyond the crisis, is what, what were our structures? Were they there for us? And if we don't choose to reform them and make them better for the future, not to deal with another COVID, but to deal with whatever is, comes towards us, then we will never have that opportunity to reform. A crisis is always a time to reflect, be honest and have humility and say, what do we need to change in order that we don't get into this situation again? And with that, I'll end and hand back to you, Ali, and I, I hope at least some of that was, um, was of interest to some. That was very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, that was a very inspiring talk. Um, I heard that the DFG's response is heading into the right direction, but there is still some work to do. Um, and, and you showed us the complexity of the whole um, situation. But we have some questions now that came in already uh, during your talk. And I just want to, I, I start with the, the first one I have here on my screen. Um, uh, there are uh, colleagues here that really liked your comment about the need for non-silo science for overcoming structural problems. Uh, the question is, how do you see the role of science policy interfaces in that context? Are they sufficiently considering complexity? <laughs> <Huh. laughs> <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> no. I, th I think the, the simple answer is no. Uh, I think the more complicated answer is I, I, think I think we're in a... I think we need to feel we're in a, a period of transition. And, and when you're in a period of transition, I think two things are important. Is one, not to be fearful of the future. And the second uh, one is to not, not think that the past was all bad. <laughs> there's, there's a huge amount of incredibly positive things we need to keep hold on. And, and when you go through periods of transition and therefore reform, it's really important to not throw all of that away. It, 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 it's building on that rather than replacing it. Um, but I do think our structures, and I would talk here about welcome, I think we have, for instance, in the arena of climate change, which is one of our major focuses now in health, I think we have, as an organisation, have really struggled where we have historically been something of a reductionist scientific approach, a lot of work in genetics, genetics to protein, protein to product, etc. And we've struggled with the complex systems approach that that is the probably the solution to climate issues and may well be also part of the solution to pandemics. And I, I think that behoves all of us to say in this new, more interrelated, interactive and in, uh, integrated approach, which has one, in, one wave has multiple effects across the whole of society. How do we construct that scientific uh, response to it without forcing it? I don't believe it's the job of funders, and I think they fail when they create false marriages, false partnerships, false collaborations. I think this, this does have to come bottom up, but I do worry that there are some structural impediments in our funding bodies, in our universities, in our institutions, that make that more difficult and more challenging. And, and the last thing I'd say in answer to this is, is what I'm not in favour of is a thin layer of knowledge at the interdisciplinarity approach. I, what I'm not in favour of is people with a lot of little bits of knowledge, not really enough deep expertise working together. I'm much more in favour of seeing how we can get deep expertise in vertical systems, but apply it in a more horizontal way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. A next question would be, what does COVID becoming a endemic mean for not only adapting, uh, for not only adaptation of existing vaccines, but the necessity of an ongoing COVID-specific vaccine development? Yeah, obviously great question. And there'll be people on this call better at answering this than me. But I, 
I think maybe not, I don't know whether for the first time or, or the, many of these words not necessarily appropriate, but, but I think we are witnessing the transition from a, a very acute, very disruptive pandemic phase into uh, an endemic phase. Now, that transition, in my view, will take many years. It'll depend on, it'll depend on things we cannot be sure about, the evolution of the virus, of course, the uh, population landscape of immunity, uh, uh, the future uh, access to vaccines, access to treatments. But I think we will witness a transition phase, which may be protracted and long and bumpy uh, from the current phase into a more endemic phase that will last uh, many years. I do think, again, science has, uh, can help provide answers to this. I think the first generation vaccines that we have um, have been remarkable. I think humanity has been lucky because there was more immunity to natural infection than perhaps certainly I thought in the first half of 2020. And we've been able to mimic that with vaccines to some degree. But we should also be honest, these vaccines are very good at preventing you getting ill, going to hospital and dying uh, if you get them. Uh, they, they are good if you get vaccinated. Um, they're not nearly as good at stopping transmission or indeed stopping infection. They're not sterilizing. Uh, and I believe that there will be second generation and third generation vaccines that maybe target the mucosal surfaces better than these vaccines do, uh, maybe longer lasting, maybe adjuvanted, uh, maybe combination of, um, of vaccines, either mix and match or, or uh, allied RNA vaccines plus, plus other um, uh, to allow a more targeted approach both to the immune system, the mucosal service, and to reduce transmission. So I, I don't think the vaccines will stop at these vaccines that we have. And there's a critical need to continue to fund vaccine work that will generate the second and third generation vaccines that I would hope in the future will drive us towards a better degree of sterilizing uh, immunity. And I think that is the transition. But we should also Bear in mind throughout this that at the moment, the vaccines that certainly I know of essentially all target a single protein and a single part of one protein on the virus. And that is going to put uh, continued pressure on that virus. And I think we're going to need to diversify that uh, vaccinology and immune response uh, beyond what is at the moment essentially targeted at a very small part of the virus. Thank you. The next question goes to a very different level. So I'd say the fourth cycle circle of your impact circles, uh, asking for what does your call for a holistic systems approach mean for global development cooperation and the strategies to tackle the many already existing crises in the global south, poverty, famine, human security, etc. Yeah, and ultimately, I think this is the, the key question. Um, and I, I do think this is going, we're going to have to look very hard at, at this. Um, uh, on a funding level, I don't think in the future this can totally rely on purely overseas development assistance. Um, I think we're going to have to find different models uh, to allow us to take the approach that you talk about. Um, uh, I also do have concerns that the agencies that we have, all of which were essentially structured either in the 1940s, 1950s, the World Bank, the IMF, um, indeed the United Nations and the, and the uh, technical agency of the World Health Organization, uh, but then also the, the more recent ones uh, that have done fantastic jobs, the Gavis and the Global Funds and the CEPIs of this world, which Germany has been a huge supporter of all of those. But I wonder whether in the complex new world of geopolitics, whether we need to look at those structures themselves, um, the speed at which they can act, uh, the freedom they have to act when, again, it goes back to my comment earlier about when domestic politics pulls you in one direction and which in, in some parts of the world, UK and, and over a few years uh, in the US become more nationalistic. Uh, and yet your international responsibilities are growing all of the time. And I, I, I worry that the, those agencies, World Bank, IMF, um, which are the preserve in the leadership, World Bank of always an American, IMF always a European, does that make sense in the new world order? Does the Security Council construct um, really work at the moment? Uh, and then if you take the health agencies and look at, say, Gavi and, and the Global Fund, 
uh, in the next five or ten years, I very optimistic, probably for the first time in my career, that we will actually have vaccines, for instance, for tuberculosis and malaria. Um, will in the future those go towards Gavi or will they go towards the Global Fund focused on HIV, TB, malaria? It's difficult to know. And I, I wonder whether this fragmentation of our global health architecture is actually both able to uh, deal with day-to-day -day issues that are happening all the time and secondly, be able to pivot quickly enough to deal with a crisis when it when it comes. And I wonder whether we shouldn't look at whether those all of those agencies actually need reform in order to deal with both the geopolitics of our time, but also the needs and demands of um, of both what happens every day and the ability to respond uh, when things change. Yeah, I think one question related to this complex is the question if at all international collaborative research could ease the geopolitical tensions to any extent e.g with china so i i uh, um i could have asked the same question and i my answer to that is undoubtedly yes i i in fact i think it's almost a responsibility of what i regard as the broader cultural um, sector now th that is so science is is our part of that but there are other parts of that the the um, uh, the art sector uh, even sport I, I I think these these can often be a bridge and historically have often been a bridge where geopolitics doesn't want to go um, and I think we have a responsibility I feel a responsibility that we must, as scientists, argue for this scientific cooperation, uh, that we must argue for the sharing of information, data, samples, of course, but we must also argue for sharing the benefits of that data and samples. It is, I think, no longer acceptable to say the world must share its data unless we also commit to sharing the benefits of sharing that data. And we've got better at the first bit of it, I think sharing has been much better. The scientific community has had a remarkable two years of, of progress, but also of sharing and transparency in the work it was doing. Absolutely remarkable. We have not made the case, I think, as strongly enough as a community that if we are going to share the information, the data, the samples, then we must share the benefits of it. And at the moment, that means sharing access to vaccines and treatments and oxygen and PPE. Uh, in what is still, I'm afraid, a very inequitable world. I, I don't believe we can make the case just for sharing of information and data and samples unless we also make the case for sharing the benefits of sharing that information. And, and I think science has got a responsibility to bridge those geopolitical divides, uh, to reach out to partners uh, around the world and to show that science can uh, show a way forward that hopefully our political colleagues will follow. Thank you. I think this is very much in line with DFG's policy. And I see a comment here from Katja Becker. She says, we are in close contact with UK, UK and I, UKRI and welcome to further strengthen our long-standing and successful collaboration. I'm afraid we are close to to our end now. So thank you so much for your brilliant talk. This is one comment I read here. If you look at implementation where social and behavioral sciences results um, are implemented sufficiently, and if, uh, if not, what are the major barriers? Oh, that's a big question. I'm not <laughs> sure if we can answer this in 30 seconds, but I think that's, uh, that's also dealing with the overall complexity you uh, yeah, showed it, us. Yeah, it is, and it's not possible to answer in 30 seconds other than I, I absolutely agree with, with the thinking behind the question. and. And if we look at the challenges we have today, and it's no different in the UK or, or Germany or in any other country, uh, they're not just uh, challenges of biomedical sciences. They're also challenges of behaviour, they're challenges of trust, of communication, uh, of how we encourage and facilitate actions that we think are in the common interest, but also in individuals' interest. I don't think we understand that nearly well enough, and the more work on that, linked with all of the other work, as I said, in a more integrated way, I think is the future. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much for this very great talk and interesting conversation we had. Uh, it was very good to have you. Um,
perhaps you still also have some time to look around at the platform uh, at the conference and look into the very interesting projects we, uh, they, that are presented here. So thank you for being here and have a good day. Thank you. Great pleasure. And I look to joining you in, in Bonn and or Berlin in, in the near future. Thank you're, you very, you're very, very much. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So the audience will have time for a quick break soon. Uh, afterwards, at 10.20, we will open the discussion forum in eight thematically clustered rooms. And there is an opening of each room and uh, by one member of the Commission of Pandemic Research. And uh, at 13.50, after the lunch, uh, there's also, a, again, an opening of each thematically clustered room. Um, I'm sorry. Good. Members of the Commission will host your poster session and moderate the discussion where necessary. We hope that the platform gives you room and opportunity for a lively exchange that goes beyond the closer specialist range. That is why we clustered the projects in overarching uh, rooms. We already saw a vivid interest uh, in networking and cross-disciplinary collaboration in the feedback you gave us with your registration. So please go to your room of interest at 10.20. And how do you find your room of interest? Uh, you just click lobby at the main stage and then you select a cluster. Um, you can, you find them all, right, all there and you find an overview of all the projects that are in the uh, thematic cluster and you just click on the project and then you are there at the project, at the poster and the discussion at the scheduled time. So, see you there at 10.20, have a break and see you later. <laughs>